Hello everyone. Please imagine a typical person with alopecia areata. The image which come to mind are probably similar to these images from the YouTube stories. However, alopecia areata can develop at any age, from infancy to the age of 80 years or even more. So when you look at this graph, which shows the age when patients develop alopecia areata, about 12% have their first episode at the age of 50 or more. And this is what we call the late onset alopecia areata. There are some typical features of the late onset alopecia areata. First, there is a predominance of women in this group unlike the early onset alopecia areata, which is approximately equal men and women. One of the studies shows that approximately two thirds of the patients with late onset alopecia areata are women. Second, late onset alopecia areata is significantly less commonly associated with a positive family history compared to the early onset disease. Less of 5% of patients who develop alopecia areata after the age of 50 have a family member with the same hair disease. It was nicely shown in the study by Eileen Tan and co-workers that the disease severity depends on the age of onset. And if we take the group of patients with the most severe alopecia areata, approximately 36% of patients will have the severe form or the more severe form of alopecia areata if they had the onset of the disease before the age of 40. If the patients had a disease onset at the age of 40 or more, the risk of having the more severe course of alopecia areata is only 5.5%. 68 to 80 percent of patients with late onset alopecia areata have a multifocal disease with less than 25 percent of scalp involvement and that alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis is really rare in this group of patients. Patients with late onset alopecia areata it is really quite common to have positive antinuclear antibodies. If we have a patient with hair loss, with patchy hair loss and positive antinuclear antibodies, how can we differentiate alopecia areata from focal alopecia in the course of systemic lupus erythematosus? There are several methods to do this. We can check the classification criteria for lupus. Of course, the classification criteria are not diagnostic criteria, but they may be helpful. Second, the clinical features may be different. And third, we can look at trichoscopy. Clinically, the main difference is that in alopecia areata, you may have total hair loss within a patch, and this never happens in systemic lupus erythematosus. So when you take a look at the right image, such partial hair loss or partial hair regrowth may be present as well in alopecia areata as in systemic lupus erythematosus. The typical features of alopecia areata in trichoscopy are well known, so I will focus today on something what may be a little bit more typical for late onset alopecia areata. First of all, you may find either very discrete yellow dots and often no dots at all. This is different compared to the typical picture of total hair loss in patients with alopecia areata with early onset. Here in the small image, you see multiple very clearly visible yellow dots. This is not the case in late alopecia areata. You may ask why are there no yellow dots in patients with late onset alopecia areata? The reason is because the yellow dots are at least partly dependent on the activity of the sebaceous glands. And the sebaceous glands stop being active in the postmenopausal age. So the older the patient, the less likely we are to see yellow dots in trichoscopy. I can also say from my experience that in late onset alopecia areata, I very rarely see clear trichoscopy signs of disease activity, such as the black dots or the exclamation mark hairs. Rather, we will find some very discrete features, such as you see in this image, some tapered hairs 
or other features of ongoing disease. Patients with late onset alopecia areata may not have the trichoscopy features as we know them from the books. So it may be really difficult to make the diagnosis and especially if there are no dots, no hair shafts, and it may be extremely difficult to make the differential diagnosis between alopecia areata and cicatricial alopecia. And this is especially the case in late, late onset or very late onset alopecia areata and patients who are 70 plus or 80 plus. And in such cases, I will always perform a biopsy first to check whether there are hair follicles and whether they are intact and third, to also check whether or not there are inflammatory infiltrates. It seems that there is a distinct genetic background for late onset alopecia areata. There are polymorphisms in the gene which encodes the subunit beta of interleukin 12 and in the gene which encodes the interleukin 23 receptor, which are typically associated with late onset alopecia areata. Based on this data, I thought that I will check how alopecia areata is responding to use the Kinumab, which is an inhibitor of both interleukin 12 and interleukin 23. And there are not many data, only case reports. Some of them say that alopecia areata is improving after use the Kinumab. Some of them say that alopecia areata is not improving after use the Kinumab. But what I found especially interesting is that there are some case reports, including uh, the report from our group, which shows that alopecia areata may develop de novo in patients who are treated with use the Kinumab for other indications. The average age in this group of patients was particularly high. This should lead us directly to the treatment, but before I focus on the treatment, few words about comorbidities. There are no good statistical data on comorbidities, and in particular, I found no comparison of the group of patients with late onset alopecia areata as compared to an age and sex matched control. So we only know that among the patients with late onset alopecia areata, there's a significant group of patients with hypertension, with diabetes, with thyroid diseases, with a history of malignancy and many, many other diseases. Interestingly, atopy and atopic dermatitis is less common in the late onset alopecia areata group compared to early onset. But it is not surprising that there are so many diseases which coexist with late onset alopecia areata because these are diseases with increased prevalence in patients who are 50 and older than 50. However, these comorbidities may be important because from the therapeutic point of view, for example, hypertension or diabetes may be significant contraindications for drugs which we use to treat alopecia areata. What is a good treatment for a patient with late onset alopecia areata? Well, basically, we may use any type of treatment which is available for alopecia areata in general. However, I believe that it is worth to consider two elements. First, that alopecia areata in the late onset form has rarely a very severe course, so we may want to start with a less potent type of therapy. And second, we have to consider the comorbidities, which may be a contrary indication to some of the treatments. I would probably in patients with a very late onset form of the disease start with corticosteroids, either with a topical form or intraregional francilolone. Systemic corticosteroids or cyclosporine is a good solution if there are no contraindications. Methotrexate is usually not contraindicated even in the elderly patients. Topical immunotherapy is available in some countries. The JAK inhibitors are a new type of treatment and they have not been specifically investigated in the late onset alopecia areata. There are multiple clinical trials in alopecia areata with JAK inhibitors. However, I found no published data which would address specifically the relationship of the age to response to therapy other than only this article which I present here. And this shows the effect of tofacitinib on alopecia areata. And here you see patients at the age of 50 or more. And in this graph, if it is 100, this means that there was a full regrowth. If it's zero, it was no response. So in this group of patients of 50 or more, you see that the patient had some response and probably a response of uh, 60, 70, or 80 may be fully satisfying. However, there are only few patients, so too early to draw any conclusions. The very good information is that almost regardless of type of therapy, the patients respond well, and you see 
complete hair regrowth or partial hair regrowth in the vast majority of patients. So just to shortly summarize the differences between early onset alopecia areata and late onset alopecia areata, the first difference is epidemiological. In the younger group, there is no gender predominance, whereas in the late onset alopecia areata, we will have a predominance of women. In early onset alopecia areata, the family history of uh, the disease is quite common, whereas in the older group, we will rarely find a family member who has alopecia areata. A third difference, the early onset alopecia areata usually has a more severe course, whereas in the late onset alopecia areata, the course is usually less severe. However, also here, alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis is possible. The younger patients rarely have positive antinuclear antibodies, and in the late onset alopecia areata, it is possible. And I mentioned today the importance of differentiating alopecia areata with positive antinuclear antibodies from systemic lupus erythematosus with focal hair loss. A next difference is the coexistence of atopy. In the early onset alopecia areata, we will have many patients with the coexisting atopic diseases, whereas in the older group, there is no such association, which is mainly age-related. And the last difference in the patients with early onset of alopecia areata, the course of the disease and the response to therapy is very variable, whereas in the patients with late onset alopecia areata, the response to therapy is usually very good. This was a summary of the current knowledge about late onset alopecia areata. And if you are interested in hair and trichoscopy, please consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks a lot.